Prime Minister, let me uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for coming this evening to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSC. Uh, it's a great accolade that the Prime Minister comes, so thank you very much indeed. So, distinguished guests, ministers, um, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's event. We are indeed here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Hellenic Observatory. Let me uh, thank the director of the LSE, Manoush Shafiq. I think you've just seen a video of her um, giving kind words about the work of the Hellenic Observatory. Uh, and um, it's an important occasion uh, for us. You're very fortunate uh, to be with us. We appreciate uh, you being with us. But as you can probably tell, uh, we could have filled this lecture theater three times over. Uh, the demand for tickets has been uh, tremendous. And uh, I know that some are watching live stream, welcome. Uh, some are watching in another lecture theater in this building, welcome. Uh, and uh, let me also say that the uh, recording of tonight's uh, event will be made available on the LSE Hellenic Observatory uh, website, uh, so you can download that uh, later. So you're all very welcome indeed. 25 years of the Hellenic Observatory here at the LSE. Uh, it's an achievement for us. Before going any further, let me say uh, that um, in my 20 years as director of the Hellenic Observatory, I very much appreciated the observatory team. We are a very good team working together. And I would not have achieved anything like what we have done without the support of my colleagues, Dr. Spiros Economides, Dr. Vasilis Modokriotis, and now Maria Komninou. They are a tremendous uh, support and I would uh, like to ask you to please join me in thanking them. They've done a great job. So we've agreed this evening, as you've seen from the pre-publicity, we're going to have a conversation about the challenges uh, facing Greece and Europe. And uh, we hope to uh, make time at the end for uh, questions from you, the audience. Uh, so it's a great occasion for us. We're delighted the Prime Minister is here. Can you please join me in, in welcoming the Prime Minister of the Hellenic Observatory of the Hellenic <laughs> I know there's an election coming, but he's not actually a candidate for the directorship of the Hellenic <laughs> Conservative just, just yet. There are aspirations and there are other things on the agenda. Join me in, th in thanking uh, the Prime Minister. Well, that was a good start, wasn't it? Well, your <laughs> aspiration in terms of switching jobs was... <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure you have the CV. So uh, the first question uh, I've got to ask you is a question my wife posed, insisted that I ask you this evening. And she said it uh, in that way that you can't resist a wife's uh, um, exhortation. She said, um, if the British were to give the Parthenon marbles back to Greece, would you be willing to be prime minister of the UK? <laughs> Well, first of all, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here um, uh, with you, uh, and uh, let me congratulate you on uh, 25 very successful years. I think the Hellenic Observatory has made a tremendous contribution to the study uh, of modern Greece, and a lot of this is uh, due to your commitment. What many of you probably don't know is that I was at the LSC 35 years ago uh, as an exchange student during my fall semester. Uh, I decided to leave uh, Harvard for, uh, for a term at the LSC where I took my first uh, courses in, in, in public choice and I still have very, very fond memories. At the time, this building did not, uh, did not exist, but I'm very happy that the school has made tremendous progress. So back to your um, 
uh, to your question, obviously the, the question of the reunification of the Parthenon um, uh, sculptures is very close to, to, to my heart. And I think a cause that uh, all, uh, all Greeks would uh, very much um, uh, would like the government to, to work um, um, uh, towards uh, achieving. Uh, is it uh, doable? Potentially. Uh, yes. Uh, and you see progress in that? Uh, we've seen progress. I don't want to speak publicly uh, about the discussions that we uh, we have had, but I think there is a a better sense of understanding that maybe a a win win solution can be uh, can be found uh, that uh, uh, will result uh, uh, in a reunification uh, uh, of the Parthenon sculptures uh, uh, in in Greece, while at the, at the same time also taking into consideration, you know, concerns that the British Museum may have. So I don't want to say anything more okay. in public about this at uh, at present. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, again, I do sense the momentum. I know that uh, you know, the British public opinion, I think, is supportive of the idea that the Parthenon sculptures yes. should be. And again, I use the word reunited rather than returned uh, on purpose, because we are talking about a monument that essentially was broken up in half. And uh, we all appreciate the value of observing these uh, treasures in situ right next to the Acropolis in our marvelous um, Acropolis Museum. That's great. So as announced, uh, I'd like to talk about the challenges facing uh, Greece and facing Europe. And I was trying to think of uh, a coherent theme. And if I may, I think the connecting theme might be in terms of uh, the future for liberal values, liberal uh, principles. And if we start with Europe, we'll come on to talking about Greece uh, later. I was thinking last week that um, if we look at Europe today, I wonder whether when future historians look at these times, whether they would describe this as a period in which we were moving towards or from liberal principles and values in Europe. Of course, I have in mind uh, the challenges the European Union has in terms of Poland and Hungary. Uh, the idea that the European Union uh, has to try to uh, persuade countries to respect democracy, human rights, the rule of law. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, we've had the uh, election in Italy with uh, um, Prime Minister Maloney. I wonder, are there reasons for optimism, pessimism in terms of uh, the, what the European Union stands for in terms of liberal principles? First of all, I think that the basic principles of, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of the rule of law for all members of the European state are non-negotiable. And as you know, there is a sort of gold standard in terms of uh, the assessment, the official assessment by the European Commission regarding the state of the rule of law in all member states. And this is what we all observe. And I think it is probably the only really uh, independent assessment of how well we, we rank when it comes to these issues. Uh, of course, uh, in my mind, there's a need for constant uh, improvement when it, when it comes to these topics. And as far as Greece is concerned, we take the observations uh, um, um, very, very um, uh, seriously, and we constantly try to improve. Now, uh, is, have, have we seen sort of a retrenchment when it comes to the values of liberal democracy? I don't think this is just a, a European trend. Uh, I think that liberal democracy is facing serious challenges uh, on numerous fronts, including the rise of populism. Mm. And uh, when I speak about populism, I'm referring to both the populism of the left and the populism uh, of uh, of the right, we've had our own experience with populists in power uh, in uh, Greece. Uh, while uh, at the same time, we are constantly in need, I think, to reinvent what modern liberal democracy truly means, and to to convince everyone that at the end of the day, uh, apart from the fact that we think it is a morally superior form of government, it is also a more effective form of government in terms of delivering real results for our people. But this struggle between in a simplified way between democracies and, uh, and autocracies, at the end of the day, is not just a, a moral struggle. It's also a struggle about which form of government is, at the end of the day, 
uh, most, uh, most effective. But there seems to be a credibility problem, doesn't there, that if the European Union has to threaten to withhold funds, money, from Hungary and, and Poland, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we think, how the hell did we get into this kind of uh, situation where uh, there seems to be a credibility challenge for the European Union? What do we stand for? Yeah, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are dispersing European funds, which are, you know, money uh, that is, you know, given to European institutions by European taxpayers. And there, there is a certain conditionality attached to those funds. And part of the conditionality uh, involves uh, respecting, you know, the fundamental premises of the rule of law. And I can tell you, this is a big in terms of carrots and sticks, mm. this, this can be uh, a very, very important stick. Now, uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about the, the state of the rule of law and this concept of illiberal democracies, which frankly is also rather disturbing um, uh, to me. I should point out that when you look at Hungary, for example, uh, I was one of the, the proponents when I was still leader of the opposition that uh, uh, Fidesz should not be part of the family of the European People's Party and at least should be suspended until we yes. see progress uh, on, uh, on that front. Uh, but uh, one needs to be uh, aware of the fact that there is always significant conditionality attached to the disbursement of mm. European funds. And if you look at the most recent uh, financial instrument that we have put in place, the Recovery and Resilience Fund, the rules are extremely strict, uh, as they should be, because we're talking okay. about significant uh, uh, sums of money. Uh, we need to be very, very consistent uh, in terms of convincing the European Union that A, we, we adhere to our plan, uh, that the funds will be used for what we told European institutions that they will be used in our case for significant reforms, and B, that there will be full transparency in terms of how the funds are used. I suppose the other credibility test at the moment, of course, is the European Union's response to Ukraine. And again, some of the same governments, particularly uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, has been um, seen in the international press, at least, as being ambiguous in the response to Putin's attack on uh, the Ukraine. Uh, do you think a, it is a credibility test? And do you think the European Union is passing the test? I think it is passing the test of unity and resolve in terms of supporting uh, Ukraine materially. Uh, we uh, should not forget that we've agreed eight packages of sanctions against Russia. These require unanimity, uh, and they have been agreed after uh, systematic negotiations, but uh, that is the way the European Union works. Sometimes we have to sort of exhaust ourselves uh, in uh, um, uh, uh, day-long negotiations until we reach an agreement. We all support uh, Ukraine. I think most, if not all, European countries also support Ukraine militarily, as does Greece. So in terms of our commitment to Ukraine, uh, I think we have passed the test and the European Union is geopolitically much more united. Where I have more doubts is in terms of our response when it comes to energy. Uh, we've uh, seen uh, Russia systematically yeah. uh, uh, weaponizing uh, gas uh, to put pressure on European uh, societies. I've been making the case for many months now that we need a, a much stronger and much more committed European response to this blackmail, because that is essentially what Russia is, is, is currently doing. We've made some progress uh, when it comes to coming up with a European energy strategy, but we're clearly not there yet. We've been advocating for a cap on price um, uh, regarding Russian natural gas that is uh, um, uh, uh, sold to Europe through the what we call the TTF mm. uh, index. Uh, again, some progress has been made. Hopefully, we'll be able to agree um, at the level of our ministers before the next uh, uh, European Council. But clearly national priorities when it comes to energy in what is still a fragmented European energy market uh, has made our lives much more, much more difficult. I suppose the other big credibility test is Turkey and President Erdogan. And I wonder uh, if we see the European Union as a system of liberal principles and values, then how far is the European Union displaying those in terms of response to Turkey? Have in mind things like the 2016 agreement the European Union signed with Turkey about the uh, refugees, allegations in the press that Turkey is pushing uh, asylum seekers into uh, Greek territory. 
uh, responses in terms of uh, Turkey's clampdown on uh, human rights, uh, etc. Uh, if you wanted to have one test of uh, what does the European Union stand for, is it passing the test with President Erdogan? Well, it's uh, very clear to me that um, uh, the relationship between the European Union, not just Greece and Turkey, has become much more complicated over the past years. Turkey is very clearly pursuing a revisionist agenda abroad, uh, projecting uh, sort of old uh, imperial uh, ambitions uh, and thus causing problems with all its neighbors, including um, uh, Greece. We have been, uh, on the one hand, clearly committed to uh, an open dialogue with Turkey. At the same time, we've made it very clear that we will defend our sovereignty and our sovereign rights, and that we will not uh, accept any fait accompli um, you know, when it comes to our region. At the same time, of course, there are also uh, issues when it comes to, to human rights, uh, uh, the human rights situation in, uh, in Turkey. There are issues uh, even uh, which are also close to our heart, for example, the, uh, the conversion of the uh, Hagia Sophia monument, what was built as a, as a Christian Orthodox church, was later converted into, into a mosque, was made into a museum to celebrate the history of the monument, again reconverted into a mosque, I think a, a mistake in, in, in my mind and an indication of how religion sometimes is weaponized uh, by the Turkish uh, uh, leadership. And of course migration. We uh, uh, were faced with a, a, a very open instrumentalization uh, of the refugee problem back in March 2020, when Turkey openly and publicly pushed tens of thousands of desperate people and encouraged them, facilitated them um, to, to cross into, uh, into Greece. Uh, we made our position very clear at the time. Uh, we defended our border. Uh, the European Union supported us. Uh, and uh, we also told and encouraged Turkey to return to the spirit of the 2016 migration uh, agreement and not weaponize desperate people. Unfortunately, the situation is still continuing. We have uh, um, uh, people trying to cross into Greece every day uh, mm. on very dangerous uh, inflatable uh, boats. These people could be stopped on the Turkish coast. Uh, quite frequently, they are stopped by our uh, uh, Coast Guard. Sometimes they're picked up by the Turkish Coast Guard as they should be doing. Other times they're actually yes. nudged. And I'm using a very a very careful world, I mean, because it's it's happening much more aggressively. Yes. We're being pushed uh, into, uh, into to, Greece uh, um, uh, by, the, by the Turkish Coast yeah. Guard. I'd like us to talk about uh, migration a little bit uh, later, but I wonder, um, you know, questions of uh, Greek territorial waters, infringements of the Greek airspace, uh, etc. Uh, I just wonder whether the European Union, in your mind, is actually offering you the support that a liberal system um, should be expected. The response is uh, we've made significant progress in terms of convincing our European allies, but also our transatlantic allies, that what is at stake here is not just the sovereignty uh, of Greece, but regional stability in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the last thing we need at a time when we're faced with an open war uh, in the European heartland is another source of conflict mm. and tension in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think this argument actually uh, resonates. At the same time, we have demonstrated as, as a country that adheres to uh, a, a rules-based international order that we can respect international law and resolve these types of problems with other neighbors. For example, we have signed uh, maritime delimitation agreement with Egypt uh, after 15 years of negotiations. Uh, we've signed a similar one with, um, uh, with Italy. With Albania, we've agreed to disagree, but take our difference to the international court, which is another way of resolving uh, these uh, differences. What you cannot do is you cannot reforce and re resolve these differences uh, by, uh, by force. That is simply uh, not acceptable. Uh, and at the end of the day, this is our major difference with, with Turkey, the delimitation of, of, of maritime zones. It is technically a complex problem because of the uh, geography of the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean, but it is a problem that could be solved if, if there were real uh, goodwill and a willingness to engage uh, in honest uh, in negotiations. But of course, when there's constant finger pointing on behalf of Turkey, you know, Greece being portrayed as the aggressor, threats to the sovereignty of our islands, uh, these are simply unacceptable um, uh, arguments uh, that make it very difficult to sit down and have a reasonable dialogue, because I don't think 
many you know in the audience and i'm not i'm not, I'm not speaking about those who are greek uh, but um, uh, many of those neutral observers of our region not many people believe that the greek islands are a threat to the turkish mainland but quite a few people would believe that the turkish mainland is a threat uh, to um, the greek islands. so what we've done in a nutshell is keep the door of dialogue open, but at the same time, make sure we strengthen our deterrence capability, invest in our armed forces, and build a strong network of alliances uh, that uh, makes uh, peace and stability in the Eastern Mediterranean a, a central pillar uh, of our sort of common understanding of what should happen in our region. Okay, if it's into economic policy for the European Union, then of course, um, Greece has been through a very difficult debt crisis. And the European Union is now tackling the post-COVID uh, period. I wonder, what do you think Europe has actually learned from the Greek debt crisis? How is it? How has uh, Europe adjusted? Do you think or changed in response to the Greek crisis? Oh, we could uh, probably spend many hours debating the mistakes that were made uh, <laughs> during the European debt crisis, both by Greece but also by the European institutions. Uh, uh, but I think we have learned our lessons. Certainly uh, in, uh, uh, in Greece, I think the one lesson that we've learned, and maybe we'll, we'll touch upon it as, as the discussion yes. proceeds, is that we need real ownership of, of meaningful reforms. I suppose in, at mm -hmm. the European level, what I had in mind was yeah. that uh, when we think of the recovery and resilience... Yeah, but I think what we, what we learned uh, at the European level is exactly that, that at some point... Uh, we need to leverage the yes. collective strength and credibility and credit rating of the European Union, raise money at the European level, uh, and then be sort of uh, willing to offer this money to the weaker states, mm. not just as loans, but as grants, but to finance real investment in those areas which are critical for the well-being of the Union as a whole. So if you look at Greece... 31 billion euros in total out of the RRF envelope, the biggest percentage of any country as a percentage of our GDP, directed towards you know, green transition, digital transition, skills, um, you know, competitiveness of, uh, of industry, or, you know, areas that have been identified by us, not by the Europeans, uh, as being critical um, to making sure that Greece stays on a high growth uh, trajectory. Yes, at the European level, it seems as though uh, there's a shift, uh, much lighter monitoring, much lighter conditionality. Oh, I'm, not and, sure. I'm, I'm not sure about lots of money. Well, uh, money. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that. First of all, when you looked at the programs in the past, a lot of it was, uh, you know, very strict conditionality. In, in, in retrospect, excessive austerity, uh, really pushing almost in a punitive manner, uh, you know, a country... Uh, on its knees, you know, big mistakes in terms of uh, the fact that the, the, the debt problem was not addressed in the first program, but was addressed in the second program. And at the end of the day, no real ownership of the reforms, uh, at least uh, I would argue by the, by the, by the governments of, uh, of, of the left, certainly not by the, by the series of government. I think right now what you have is you have a reform program that is owned by the country. We have the privilege of having Professor Pisaridis in our uh, audience, who actually was one of the authors of, of a very important study that identified the important reforms for the next decade for the country. And we are really trying hard in implementing these reforms. But these reforms are also um, a conditionality for the RRF. So the conditionality is still there. I would argue that the disbursement of the RRF funds is actually stricter than the disbursement of the usual Ooh. structural funds that the European Union um, has been uh, 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 handing out to uh, member states for regional policy. And it's probably, uh, and, and, it's, and I think it's the right approach. Greece is one of the first countries to receive, uh, we just received uh, you know, approval for our second tranche. Um, from the RRF uh, funding, uh, which means that we're taking the boxes. But again, those boxes, and this is very important, they were not imposed upon us by the European Union. We went to the European Union. We told uh, the you know, institutions, this is what we want to do. This is why these reforms are good for the country. Give us the money to implement them. I suppose, um, crudely, Europe has gone from uh, a paradigm of order liberal uh, principles to something which is 
rather more Keynesian of uh, spending the money to uh, uh, boost uh, growth. And I wonder, given the heterogeneity of the European Union, what if it fails? Uh, what if uh, a German voter uh, feels that all of this money has actually been wasted by governments who are not in investing uh, in the future, but consumption? And uh, I've been reading before uh, our conversation that some have suggested that Greece is uh, spending uh, some of the money, more of the money on consumption than in investment. Mm. Uh, how would you see that? Well, first of all, for a monetary un union to function, uh, you know, uh, we, we we need uh, you know consistency uh, in terms of uh, in terms of policy. We are all tied to the same currency, to the same uh, in interest rates, and you know the weaknesses uh, of of having a monetary union without you know joint fiscal capacity and without an ability to impose common rules was at the end of the day at the heart uh, of the eurozone crisis uh, back in 2009 2010. But you know it it, it did start in Greece, and in Greece we clearly went through a period where we borrowed to spend. Mm. And I think we've learned our uh, our lesson. But as we, we, have we have spent a lot of money in Greece during COVID, as most governments did. But I think we did it in a smart way. Uh, our emphasis was always to preserve um, jobs and to make sure that uh, we don't uh, push unemployment up and to support uh, businesses. And frankly, if, if the markets were really concerned about the behavior of the government, you would see the Greek spreads widening very, very quickly. The fact that it's not happening is testimony to, in my mind, the, you know, the, the, the general understanding that we are pursuing what is at its heart a prudent fiscal policy. We will be having a primary surplus next year, and we're bringing down our debt to GDP ratio faster than any other European country. So, uh, and at the same time, we've been able to move the country into a high growth trajectory. I mean, Greece will grow at almost 6% this year. Um, compare that to many other countries, which means that we've done something right in terms of uh, um, uh, addressing structural deficiencies of the Greek economy. Much lower growth next year. Yeah, but still three times higher than the Eurozone average. And so I'll take that, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so, and, and uh, I, would, uh, uh, I would argue that, you know, next year, uh, we may have a recession in many European countries. Uh, it's uh, a, an energy-driven recession. The cost of energy has, has mm. gone through the roof. Uh, but still, uh, how are we compensating? I, I need to stress that primarily not through consumption, through investment. And a lot of this investment is private investment. Okay. So Greece and the, the green economy, you've referred to energy. Uh, you're planning to continue to use coal. Uh, that's not a very green uh, policy. Uh, there's also those who criticize um, your actions in terms of uh, the tourism uh, sector, mm -hmm. allowing buildings in zones where uh, the environment could be uh, threatened by uh, mm -hmm. development, etc. So there seems to be two twin uh, uh, tax here that uh, where is the green economy uh, for Greece? You're relying on coal and you're allowing tourism development uh, without adequate restriction. Good, well, I, I disagree with both these premises. So let me explain <laughs> what, what I mean. When, I, when we came into power uh, back in 2019, I, I was very explicit and said, we want to move away from coal as quickly as possible, which we did. Um, we were producing out of the you know 60 you know, terawatt hours of energy that we require in Greece, approximately five came out of coal. Uh, what we did as a short-term measure was to ramp up a little bit our coal production because we cannot be totally relied on natural gas, which was a transition um, fuel as we moved away from coal. There was a fantasy uh, in the mind of many of those who were talking uh, about you know, the green transition that miraculously you could away, move away from fossil fuels into renewables without anything uh, as an interim solution. And that is clearly wrong. Natural gas is an interim solution. Nuclear is an interim solution, maybe also, uh, in my mind, also part of a long-term uh, solution. And renewables is the way to go. 
So uh, to those who argue that we don't have a green agenda, I would counter that we have 10 gigawatts of installed uh, wind and solar, which makes us one of the top 10 countries in the world in terms of electricity production. And uh, in October, we hit a very important milestone for, for six hours on a, on a sunny and windy day um, with limited energy consumption because it wasn't too cold and, and not too warm to use air conditioning. We powered the entire country for six hours from renewables. This is a, a, an image from the future. Uh, we're significantly adding to our renewable capacity. But in the meantime, we want to leverage our position as, as important players in the natural gas uh, uh, world, which is going to be with us for the next 20 to 30 years. Okay. Now about, about building, sure. because this, this is very close to my heart. If anything, we have made restrictions um, regarding building bu buildings much more applicable in Greece. And if, uh, if you look at the tourist development that is taking place in Greece now, uh, it's almost uh, in its entirety focused on upscale developments with uh, uh, very environmentally friendly standards, not simply because this is the way to go, but this is what the market demands. If we want to move our product up market, we need sustainable tourism. And for me, this is non-negotiable. Uh, this would mean that further restrictions uh, in terms of uh, zoning and in terms of building, a real focus on protecting the more uh, sensitive uh, um, uh, environments such as our islands. We are making huge progress in terms of decarbonizing our islands much faster uh, than uh, uh, we are decarbonizing our mainland, uh, teaming up with many international companies to offer tailor-made solutions for uh, our islands. This is being noticed by the discerning uh, travelers. And I think there will be a premium to be extracted if you actually go green, but in a meaningful manner. So sustainable tourism, and by sustainable tourism, I mean not just sustainable building, I mean the way you source your raw materials, the connection between um, uh, the, the agricultural sector and tourism, how we preserve our cultural uh, heritage. All this is part of, uh, of, of one package. Uh, this is a one-way street, uh, there is no uh, there, there is no going back, uh, and uh, there is uh, no way we'll, we'll compromise on this. Okay. People recognize your economic liberalism, but question your social liberalism. Mm. And they say, for example, in relation to citizenship rights, migration, which I want to come on to later, law and order, relations with the church, promoting the rights of women, promoting LGBTQ rights, no same-sex marriage. Oh my God, you make us look like we are a well, sort of really <laughs> backward country. Uh, yeah. I thought I'd have a little yeah. rhetorical flourish. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you get the point. There's a theme here in terms of being economically liberal, mm -hmm. but not socially uh, liberal. I would, I would argue that this government has been more socially progressive than many governments that uh, that that that, uh, that came before us that theoretically were from the center left but didn't really deliver on, on many issues. If, if you look at uh, topics such as LGBTQ rights, for example, uh, you know, short of the marriage question, which I think at some point we will be, uh, we will be going in that uh, uh, direction, we've made a huge progress uh, on, these, on these topics. Issues uh, regarding, for example, uh, um, uh, handicapped Greeks having a, you know, a, a strategy for, um, uh, for, um, for people with handicaps that uh, we are really pushing um, uh, through on all fronts. We have a strategy for, for women's rights and we're addressing uh, sort of the Me Too uh, problems, uh, you know, um, uh, head on, you know, violence against women. We were the first to set up, you know, dedicated units in our police stations uh, to address these, uh, um, uh, these issues and to openly uh, speak about them. And even in terms of the relationship between the church and the state, um, as you know, Greece has a, a constant, you know, an official, you know, constitutionally protected religion, but freedom of religion is is perfectly respected in Greece. And I would argue that the the, the church, in its own way, is is also sort of, sort of maturing and progressing. But again, of course, at the moment, these days, there's a lot of attention on the uh, issue of the um, Kipitos to Cosmo, yes. the arc of the world, uh, arc of mm. the world. Yeah and the monitoring by the state of uh, private charity organizations. And I wonder whether 
there are zones where um, Greek governments fear to tread. Maybe that was a case. Maybe it still is a case. Uh, anyhow, it is, you know, what we don't know exactly what happened, but we have enough evidence to forcefully move and use a piece of legislation that we passed to actually change um, the, the board of directors uh, of this uh, charitable organization. But the problem there is much deeper. We have still too many uh, kids who are in, in these types of, uh, of institutions. We still have not pushed uh, 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 adoptions as, as quickly as we want. And yes, we recognize that sometimes there's an economic interest uh, in, in in keeping kids uh, in these um, uh, within these institutional arrangements, which is clearly not uh, not good for them. So this 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 is a real problem. Uh, we've uh, addressed it head on uh, because we have many kids actually that uh, uh, live within the confines of Kivotos, and we've put in place a board of directors, um, uh, which certainly does not lack credibility. Very capable people, very well respected people. Who will do their best in the interest of the kids that actually uh, live there? Okay. Probably for the last year or two years, uh, there have been two big issues which have dominated the international media when uh, covering uh, Greece. Mm -hmm. One of them is the refugee situation, and the other is the recent uh, phone tapping mm -hmm. scandal. Let's start with the immigration. We've had the BBC, the New York Times. Amnesty International, accusing Greece of pushbacks. Mm -hmm. And you've been very firm in saying there haven't been pushbacks. So could you explain to the a foreign audience here mm -hmm. what, you, what you define as a pushback and how do you know that Greece isn't doing them? Well, because I'm in charge of <laughs> the country. <laughs> okay. But uh, uh, look, and we want to be very clear. Uh, the previous government had an open door policy. Essentially, anyone could enter Greece uh, as they pleased. Uh, and we've said that this is in principle not acceptable to us. Uh, country has borders and borders need to be protected, whether these are land or sea borders. What does this mean at sea? I want to be very, very clear. Uh, it means that if there's a refugee boat coming, we, we uh, are entitled to stop it uh, on what is a sea border and then call the Turkish Coast Guard to pick them up and return them. If uh, any life is a danger or if you know, people cross into Greece, they're you know, welcomed, put into um, modern facilities, entitled to uh, apply for asylum. And if they're granted asylum, they're welcome to stay in Greece. Uh, uh, if you look at what happened in the islands of the Eastern Aegean before we came into power, horrible uh, situations, Moria, was horrible. Indeed. Well, Moria no longer exists. It's been replaced by a ultra modern facility financed by the European Union. The same is true in Samos. The same is true uh, in in Hios, where these facilities are built. In Samos, it is already um, uh, it is already being uh, being built. So, uh, and of course, also processing uh, asylum applications uh, um, very very uh, quickly uh, and clearing the backlog that we inherited. But let me point out that international media is not always objective when it comes to these issues. And I will give you a very specific example. Back in the beginning of August, we faced a barrage of articles by international media, about 38 um, um, uh, refugees, migrants, apparently stranded on our islet, uh, on a river which constitutes the border between Greece and Turkey. We went looking for them, we couldn't find them. Uh, more articles uh, about uh, these people are there, why are you not picking them up? There is a dead little girl that's been buried on, the, uh, uh, on this island. Finally, 10 days later, indeed, a group you know, arrives in, uh, in Greece or being welcomed in Greece. And when we dig a little bit deeper, uh, we, we realize that these people were, A, never on Greek territory, so they could not have been picked up uh, by, uh, by you know, our Greek border patrol, and B, there never was a dead girl. And but Greece was was uh, I mean we received tons of bad press um, um, for two weeks, uh, and uh, some of the um, international media that wrote these stories they didn't even dare to apologize, but they did take down the stories. And I'm going to be very open. Spiegel that made a big issue out of this uh, story. Uh, they when we when we gave them all the data. Suddenly, three um, months later, the story has been taken down. But they did not have the guts to, to apologize to us. 
and so they simply remove the story from their website. So allow me to be a little bit skeptical uh, when it comes to international media uh, on this issue, and to also recognize that there is an information war taking place uh, on behalf of Turkey, uh, uh, with uh, you know very carefully crafted stories about how horrible you know um, Greeks are in terms of treating refugees. And I would urge international media uh, who look into the story to make sure that they check their facts and get it right. Uh, because I know how difficult it was for us to, um, uh, to refute a story, uh, which we clearly knew was not true. And then, you know, when the story disappears, nobody will notice. Uh, but, you know, the damage is, is okay. done in terms of the public okay. perception. So the big story this summer was the phone tapping yeah. mm -hmm. scandal. And uh, for the non-Greeks in the audience is the uh, reports that the uh, Nikos um, <laughs> um please be sympathetic that I've uh, forgotten his surname. Um, Nikos Andrelakis was, uh, had his uh, phone uh, tapped whilst being a member of the European Parliament. And uh, it's become a very big uh, scandal in the, in the international uh, press. Um, what is the phone tapping scandal a failure of? Well, first of all, let me distinguish between the legal wiretappings, which was the case of Nikos Andrulakis and the operation of um, uh, illegal software, um, which uh, uh, is uh, frequently used, unfortunately, in many European countries by state and non-state uh, actors that can actually have access to your phone and extract uh, information. In the case of Nikos Andrulakis, we recognized that although the wiretapping was technically legal, it should not have occurred. Uh, and uh, it how, was- how can it, how can it be that a leading politician mm -hmm. can legally have his phone tapped? Well, uh, it should not have happened and that's why people left their jobs. And that's why we were bold enough to recognize that uh, this was an institutional mistake. Why was it an institutional mistake? Because there were not enough filters um, uh, to, to check for, um, um, uh, sort of to, to make sure that uh, other people are asked uh, beyond uh, the, one, uh, the one judge who took uh, the decision. And now what we're doing to rectify this problem is to introduce a bill uh, which, uh, on top of the two judges that need to sign off for a legal yes. tapping, we also have an additional political filter, and we need the approval of the Speaker of the House, uh, uh, the Speaker of Parliament. Yes. So, there's been, if I may, there's been quite a lot of uh, mm -hmm. debate in the Greek press about this. Um, is the Speaker of the House an appropriate person to be involved in signing off the phone tapping of well, another certainly... member of Parliament? Well, he's certainly more objective. He... Look, even in the UK, uh, uh, there's always a political filter for all wiretappings. In the, in the UK, I, I, I could explain, mm -hmm. but uh, in the UK, it requires the signature of two ministers and a specially appointed judge. Well, in our case, in our case, it will be two judges. And uh, rather than having the minister sign off, I do think, and there was a lot of debate in this, but I haven't heard a better solution. So we're always open uh, to better suggestions. But uh, there seems to be a consensus that the Speaker of the House as someone who presides over the entire uh, parliament is probably more objective than a minister okay. uh, authorizing the wiretapping of a politician. This is special for politicians. So what we are doing is adding an extra layer of protection uh, uh, in, uh, in rectifying what was essentially uh, an, uh, an institutional mistake. I, I do need to point out that in the past we had, we needed two judges to sign off mm. and this law was changed by, by Syriza. Uh, to require only one judge to sign off. Not, not, an, not, a, not an excuse, although we have a sort of indications, not indications, we are pretty certain that uh, sort of the illegal spyware um, uh, has been uh, you know, active in Greece for quite some time, uh, even before we came uh, into power. But this is also a very difficult problem. I can tell you openly that you know, all my colleagues, heads of state and government, were always concerned about the safety of our communications. Uh, and uh, we, we need to take our measures. What we are doing in Greece is we're going to be the first European country to completely ban um, not, the sale and use of any illegal uh, software that gives you access to, to your phone without your uh, permission. Is this going to completely solve the problem? No, but if someone is caught using the software uh, in Greece, he could face jail.
Okay, but going back to the previous point, the, the phone tapping scandal is not a failure of the system, it's a failure of the people you appointed. It's both. It's both. Uh, and that's why we need to uh, address um, both aspects of the problem. Uh, bad decisions were made uh, in an institutional framework that did not allow for the right checks and balances. So you okay. need to address both issues. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, we're heading towards uh, elections uh, next year. Because of changes to the electoral system, everyone expects uh, two elections, uh, or many people expect two elections mm -hmm. uh, next year. And in that context, you may be faced with choices about coalition uh, partners. And I wonder, as uh, Greece's leading liberal politician, who would advance your agenda better? Uh, PASOK or the extreme right? <laughs> well, because I don't want to dodge, the, I don't want to dodge the question. Uh, I would, I, I will tell you that the extreme right is certainly out of the question. Right. So I want to make that very, very, um, very clear. Having said that, and to explain to your audience, who may not be completely familiar with the intricacies of Greek politics, uh, why we may have two elections, uh, Greece has traditionally had yes. an electoral system which gives the first party a bonus. So if you reach uh, a 37, 38, 39% threshold in terms of the popular vote, you can form a government on your own. You don't need a coalition partner. Syriza changed that electoral system to a straightforward proportional representation system, which means you need to get to 45, 46% to form a government on your own. Very difficult, practically impossible. We changed the electoral law back uh, but because of our constitution, the change in the electoral law only kicks in after the next election. So the first election will take place with uh, a straightforward proportional representation system, making it very difficult to form a government. In the second election, we would need to get to 37, 38% in order to form a government on our own. Is this doable? I think absolutely. Uh, why am I advocating for the ability to form a government on our own? Because I know that coalition uh, formation in Greece is a very complicated uh, uh, scenario. Uh, we need a government that can take decisions uh, quickly. Uh, I see a lot of my colleagues involved in very long, very prolonged uh, coalition discussions with our coalition partners at a time when we're faced with constant crisis. I do believe that it is better for the government, uh, for the country to be run by a single party government. A single party government in our case, does not mean that we're not reaching beyond the beyond the aisle to uh, recruit talent from other um, uh, sort of political. Uh, but, but what I've heard is that when you're looking around for partners, you'll be looking towards the political center, not the right. I, I made it very clear that we are, we would never contemplate. Uh, we would never contemplate an alliance with the extreme right. At the same time, I also. Uh, make it very, very, uh, uh, very clear that we are aiming uh, for an absolute majority in the second election. Uh, but it's up to the Greek people to decide whether they want us to govern on our own, should we win, and I think we have a reasonable chance of winning, uh, or whether they will essentially tell us, look for a coalition partner. At the end of the day, it's a people's decision. They know what is at, uh, at stake, and okay. they will be the ones determining uh, how the country will be governed after the okay. next elections. As I say, I'm conscious of time. I'm also conscious that many people in the audience will be uh, students who've uh, wisely chosen to come to the LSE from uh, Greece. Uh, they'll, because the students at the LSE, they're looking forward to a bright and highly successful professional career after they uh, graduate. But of course, there's the question of the brain drain. And before you came to power, you emphasized the importance of keeping talent back uh, in Greece. Brain drain is still a problem. Uh, if you're re-elected, what are you going to do to uh, persuade these people to go back to Greece? Well, I went, uh, you know, I, I was um, also someone who studied abroad, uh, yes. worked, worked in the United Kingdom, and at some point took the decision to return back in 1997. Seems like ages ago when, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, our, our first daughter, uh, was born. She was probably somewhere in the audience because she works here. I haven't spotted her 
um, uh, uh, yet. Uh, but uh, we took the decision to return, and I was willing to take a uh, a lower paying job uh, because I wanted to return to Greece because I believe the country is moving in the right direction. So I think when you when you talk to people, young people who have left, uh, they're looking for good jobs and a belief that it's worthwhile returning to Greece because they can build their career or their personal lives in Greece. Do we tick the boxes? Certainly we've created many jobs. Uh, and uh, if you look at, uh, yeah, and you talk to the big recruiters in Greece uh, and you ask them, do you receive CVs from Greeks abroad? They will tell you they receive many CVs from Greeks abroad. Uh, is the country moving in the right direction? I firmly believe that the country has turned the corner and that we're at the beginning of a good period for Greece. Uh, we've delivered in terms of our commitments. The economy is, okay. is growing, unemployment is, is coming down. And we also give some substantial incentives for those to, who return in terms of paying lower taxes um, for a certain period of time. So uh, this is a good time uh, to, uh, to return to, to Greece. Okay. Having said that, I've, I've failed to convince my own kids to do that. So I, I, rec <laughs> I recognize it's not an easy sell. Yeah. As a father, I sympathize with the difficulty of persuading children to do yeah. anything that parents advise them to do. Uh, on that uh, criterion, I've failed mm -hmm. repeatedly. Uh, it's time for some uh, questions. Can you, uh, I think there are stewards who will uh, come with microphones. Uh, if you could raise your hand and please, because of the lack of time, I know all of you are perfectly able to give long speeches. This is not an occasion to yeah. share those with us. Could you simply ask, say who you are and ask a question? Could you take the gentleman here in the center, please? Uh, the microphone is coming to you. Doesn't this work? Yes, it does. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, you are deservedly proud of your success in e-governance. and. Can I just explain this is Professor Yanis Murani, this from the Tufts University, University uh, visiting the LSE. And, and uh, my question is, uh, as a very young politician and minister, you served in the New Democracy Government 2012-2015 uh, in, in the Ministry of E-Governance and Administrative Reform. What did you learn from that experience that allowed you to launch the successful so far e-governance campaign? Well, that's a, thank you. That's a, that's a very interesting um, question. Indeed, I was minister for administrative reform and e-government. Mm. But that was my official title. I had no control over e-government. Uh, while being the minister of, 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 of e-government or e-governance, because simply all the responsibilities and all the data was dispersed uh, in, in various ministries. So, and at the same time, we realized that this is not just about data, it's also about processes. Uh, so when you actually want to digitize the state, you also have to look at uh, simplifying um, processes and bureaucracy. So what we did is create a ministry that we did it very quickly before other ministers really realized what was happening. We gave them the data, um, the ownership of the data. We gave them control over the processes. And once they started delivering, we created a virtual cycle where now every ministry wants to team up with the Ministry of E-Government because every service has digitized. Essentially, you have the Minister of E-Government plus the competent minister uh, who's getting the credit. Uh, for making uh, people's lives uh, uh, easier. So this has been a success, but I would argue it has been a governance success as much as a technological uh, success because we took good care to design this ministry a long time before we came into power. So it always pays to, to prepare for these uh, decisions. Uh, you just cannot uh, design these types of policies uh, uh, once, you're, uh, once you're elected. You need to do the work beforehand. Okay. So the questions, uh, please. Uh, gosh, uh, okay. Could we take the gentleman in the center here? With the strike jumper. Could you say who you are and ask the question, please? Thank you very much, Prime Minister. My name is Michael Russo and I'm a master's candidate studying international development. Uh, in recent years, human rights groups and journalists have raised some concerns mm -hmm. about uh, freedom of press. Uh, in Greece, including one assessment from Politico earlier this year that called Greece the uh, worst place in Europe for press freedom. Uh, could you please talk to us about what steps your government is taking to make sure that uh, the freedom of press uh, remains a right that's enjoyed by all Greeks? Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. I was hoping that you would ask it. 
because I, I do think that there is no issue in terms of freedom of press in Greece. Uh, and I think for those, at least the Greeks in the audience know that we have a vibrant press. You can write anything you want in Greece. We have TV, we have many TV channels. There's always, you know, two, two views presented, you know, the government view, the opposition uh, view. There was one report uh, by a non-governmental organization that ranked Greece 108th uh, in press freedom behind at least 30 dictatorships. Chad was 105. Uh, sorry, but that is just crap. Excuse my language. Uh, 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 I'm not saying that there are not uh, steps we can take uh, when it comes to um, further fostering uh, you know, a vibrant um, uh, civic society. But I can tell you uh, that uh, freedom of press is not an issue in Greece. If you just look at, you know, the newspapers, uh, the daily newspapers, probably three quarters are against the government, very harshly criticizing the government as they have a right um, uh, to, uh, to do. So I really don't think that there is an issue regarding the, you know, the freedom of press uh, uh, in uh, uh, in Greece, that's sort of worth really discussing uh, in significant uh, detail. I would argue, if, if anything, Greece has rather weak libel laws. Um, uh, I've personally never uh, uh, sort of taken any journalist to court as a matter of principle. I'm not doing this. But some of the things that have been written in Greece about me and my family, uh, I mean, if you try to write these in the UK, I could tell you, I mean, you'd, you'd be in serious trouble. Okay, perhaps uh, two more questions, perhaps take them together. Can we take the lady uh, with a hand up here in the white, with the white jumper? Hello, uh, my name is Kanya Hioni, and I'm studying economics and management, master. The Greek economy has achieved strong growth over the past few years. What can be done to sustain this growth in the coming years in a high inflation environment? Thank you. Okay, can we take another question? Yeah, we'll take them together and then I'll answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, there's uh, a lady over here uh, with a hand up. Uh, my name is Melina Tonyaris and I'm a lawyer uh, specializing in international law. Um, Greece has been quite vocal about uh, climate change being a pressing issue um, of, of today. And um, I'm sure you're aware of um, the Republic of Vanuatu initiative. Um, before the international, requesting an advisory opinion uh, Sorry, before the again? international court of justice. What initiative? The Just Republic that. of Anuatu initiative, oh, um, okay. seeking an advisory opinion uh, from the international court of justice on climate change. Um, given Greece's vulnerability to climate change, I was wondering what your position would be um, on this matter. Yeah, I don't know the details of the initiative. I've, I've read about it, so I um, I'm a little bit reluctant to comment in, 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 in public about the legal uh, uh, implications. What I can tell you is that the Eastern Med is a hotspot for climate change. Uh, we take issues of mitigation and adaptation very seriously. We've made a commitment to climate neutrality by, by 2050. We'll meet our targets for 2030, maybe even earlier than we had anticipated. A lot of it is driven by, uh, by changing our power mix and moving towards uh, uh, renewable energy, while at the same time, um, uh, we know that we also need to invest in, in adaptation, uh, especially when it comes to protection, uh, uh, protecting our forests from uh, wildfires and uh, the real sort of uh, extreme weather events associated with climate crisis. Now, on the question regarding growth, uh, I would argue just continue the path of reforms, making sure we continue to attract investment uh, and make the economy as extrovert as possible. There's one statistic you should remember, I think, which is worthwhile noting, is that in 2010, 20% of Greek uh, you know, of Greek GDP was experts of goods and services. Now we're at 40%. So the economy is really becoming more competitive, more extrovert, uh, and this is a path we need to uh, to take. Uh, and if we are re-elected um, uh, as a second-term government, I think we have learned a lot about. I know this is an issue that you care a lot about. What does you know, how should a prime minister's office work? What does proper centralized governance mean? I really believe that we have a model that has worked better than other models in the past Indeed. in terms of driving policy, but also holding our ministers accountable. Uh, so I think we'll be, we'll be better and more effective, hopefully with uh, less crisis to deal with and focusing more on day-to-day on, on -day business. Okay, 
uh, we've run out of time, but uh, the Prime Minister has agreed that uh, we're going to have a reception immediately outside this lecture theatre, and you're all invited to come and uh, talk informally outside the uh, lecture theatre, uh, just through the doors uh, here. Uh, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Hellenic Observatory. Uh, could I put down a marker that we'll invite you back in 25 years' time to? Um, <laughs> and of course, I'm young enough to be. Well, anyway. Well, there's a, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, after politics, there's a, I can envision a career in, uh, in teaching. So maybe I'll take over your job. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and I think we'll do that very well. Just a moment. I'm going to ask you to remain in your uh, seats whilst uh, the Prime Minister uh, departs. You are going to enjoy some LSE wine in a moment. But uh, as a token of our uh, sincere thanks, you uh, making the time to come, can I pass you uh, this gift from the oh. LSE? And it is a, a plaque which uh, commemorates the, the resident death of the school. It is to know the causes of things. Oh. Uh, and thank so, you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me open it. And, uh, oh, it is, uh, okay. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.